SFU Public Square's uh, President's Faculty Lecture. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples on whose unceded ancestral territories we're privileged to gather. And we're doubly privileged because we have uh, with us Elder Margaret, who's going to bring greetings on behalf of the local First Nations. Elder Margaret. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, everybody's awake. Good. <laughs> Usually, this time of the afternoon, everybody's napping. Thank you for coming out to this very exciting evening. Every time SFU has an event, it's always something interesting, something exciting. And it's so good to see each and every one of you here. A quick prayer, and we'll get this event going. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together today. Just guide each and every one of us on the path that we're on. And thanking the communities from which you come from and your families for allowing us to do the work that we do. And a very special blessing on this, on this event this evening. Thank you, all my relations. Well, thank you very much, Elder Margaret Heichka. Uh, and uh, Elder Margaret's a wonderful leader of our wonderful group of elders at Simon Fraser University. Well, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this President's Faculty Lecture, particularly because it seemed three weeks ago that we weren't going to have a President's Faculty Lecture due to uh, the elements, but uh, thankfully we were able to uh, reschedule and our speaker was able to be here and now you're able to be here, so that's wonderful. This lecture series is part of SFU Public Square, and SFU Public Square is very much part of our commitment to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. We believe that by providing you with opportunities to hear from some of our leading research faculty, we can help to enlighten and promote dialogue on issues that are important to the community, important to you, and important to the university. Now, there will be a chance to raise questions and offer comments after the lecture, and you're welcome to continue the conversation at a light reception to follow. Very light, but uh, the conversation can be a little heavier. Um, I also want you to know that we are filming uh, this lecture for YouTube purposes, so if you do ask a question, you might be caught on camera. Whether that's a positive or a negative is up, for, up to you. But uh, we want to be able to share tonight's lecture with a broader audience still through our YouTube channel. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Deanna Rader. Deanna is a Cree Métis scholar who is both an associate professor in SFU's English department and chair of our Department of First Nations Studies. She also recently served as acting university librarian, so she is truly a Renaissance uh, scholar and, uh, and uh, academician. She teaches courses in Indigenous popular fiction and Canadian Indigenous literatures, especially autobiography. Her research focuses on the often overlooked archive of Indigenous literary work in Canada. Among her many achievements, she's a founding member of the Indigenous Literary Studies Association. She's series editor for Indigenous Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University Press. She's co-chair for the Indigenous Voices Awards. And in the fall of 2018, she was inducted into the College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists in the Royal Society of Canada. And the Royal Society of Canada is very much the organization that celebrates leading scholars across Canada. So that's an incredible accomplishment of which we are all very proud that uh, Deanna was recognized in this way. Her lecture tonight is entitled The Obligations of Stories, Missing Jim Brady and Abby Halkett. And I will say nothing more to impede us from hearing from Deanna Rader, except to invite her to come up here and ask you to welcome her to give tonight's lecture, Deanna. Um, hello, my name is Deanna Rader and while I've had the privilege to live and to raise my children, I'm on these territories for over 30 years. Um, I acknowledge that I am an uninvited guest on the ancestral, traditional, unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Coquitlam, and Stalo peoples. I lived in Stalo territory for quite a while and I'm very grateful for that. I come from 
and most of my family is, still is in, in on the prairies, all across the prairies. My Cree and Cree-speaking Cree and Métis family, my Neyiao and Apitokustan family, are historically from northern Saskatchewan, Green Lake, and then more recently, LaRange. I'm wondering if there's anybody here in the audience who actually has been to LaRange. If you could raise your hands. Okay. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm just looking forward to the fact that I think maybe there is someone in this room that remembers or knows Jim Brady or Abby Halkett, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards if that's the case. A lot of what I talk about today includes that story of, um, that many people still remember, the sudden unexplained disappearance in 1967 of James Brady and Absalom Halkett. And I really want to thank President Petter for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, your support of Indigenous scholarship has been really meaningful to me as I've seen that unfold. It a lot, took a lot of hard work, and I really thank you. Um, I also um, am happy to announce bec that, and because this was not this lecture was not in the middle of January, but in fact uh, early February, I can say that I am no longer in the Department of, in, of First Nation Studies um, because the um, Board of Governors has agreed that we are now the Department of Indigenous Studies. That's, that's I know, bravo. Mm -hmm. And I'm jointly appointed to uh, the, um, the Department of English. It's been an incredibly hospitable department for me as well. And I um, want to uh, just give it, let it mention, know that there is a book that is going to be the result of this search. I'm not going to give a full discussion of that search today. Um, instead, the book Cold Case North, the search for James Brady and Absalom Halkett, is in press with the University of Virginia. And I, um, it, it's, it's authored by Michael Nest, my research partner um, with me, and um, Eric Bell. I'll tell you more about it as we talk. And I, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about that tonight, um, but I will instead talk about the stories around this search and the obligation of stories. Now, one of the benefits of this not being the middle of January is that there are two images that have come out since then. And one is uh, the announcement from the Glenbow um, Gallery that uh, there's going to be an exhibit by, about with Jim, Jim Brady's photography curated by Policy Sequasis. It is, in fact, uh, Jim Brady uh, was an amazing photographer and took um, images all throughout his life and a lot of his um, archive really rests with them. And um, I, it, it's going to be opening on the 21st of March. You can't say the same about Absalom Halkett. There aren't that many images that I've been able to access. However, my cousin emailed me just this week to show me this image, which is a, 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 on a community forum. The, um, the son of Don Neely took this image, uh, um, I mean, found this image and shared it with us. So the man that's closest to us is Absalom Halkett. This was taken in July 1966, which would be less than a year before Abby passed, or disappeared, I suppose. So the stories I'm about to share focus on what's considered by the RCMP to be officially, quote, an historical missing persons case. The 1967 disappearance of Métis leader James Brady, one of the famous five political activists who helped establish the Métis Association of Alberta in the 1930s, and sitting Cree leader, Lac La Ronge band councillor, Abby Halkett. Some of these stories have been recorded in story cycles in my family and in our communities, and some I found in libraries and archives. This includes the work recently been conducted by me, my research partner, Michael Nest, who is an Australian an anti-corruption expert in the mining sector, and my cousin, Eric Bell, who's the founder of the LaRange Emergency Medical Services in Saskatchewan and a member of the Lac LaRange Indian Band. Um, the three of us recently conducted a search and worked alongside a half dozen, half 
century of those who have kept and collected details about this story. And I can say without exaggeration, as soon as people knew what we were doing, uh, at least a half dozen people came with us with their own research notes. That includes the author, Harold Johnson. It includes Lillian Sanderson, who works for the Lund Indian Band and is my cousin. It includes uh, several other people, and we're very, very grateful to that because this search um, begins with an examination of these stories and, um, and, about, and the fact that this is such an important story, such an important mystery still. What I want to think about as I remember the details are all the ways that this story has been preserved. And I often encourage my students to expand the definition of the literary archive by Indigenous people in Canada so that it includes not just writing that has been published. And those of you who are in universities and can imagine going to the archive, we often, the Western archive is often a very limited notion of, of what has been preserved. The archive that I look at includes, and I ask my students to think about, our unpublished texts, narratives that have been told and remembered, all versions of life stories, stories from different nations, storytelling canons, and I often think about the inspirational words of former Lieutenant Governor Stephen Point, the Stalo legal scholar, who talked about all of the transformer stones all across his territory as an archive in itself of the, the story, Stalo stories and legal concepts all around. And so I think we want to think about that archive being larger. Um, and I've been able to consult um, conventional archival contents, you know, police reports, inquest documents, mining records, you know, writing, but also alternative literacies, uh, family stories, community stories, interviews, you know, the bottom of a lake. As I read these texts, I'm spurred to think about what obligations are incurred when we hear these stories, what do they demand of us, and what do they demand of me. I do not remember June 1967 when Jim Brady and Abby Halkett went missing, disappeared without a trace. I would have been too young. But I do remember the stories my mother told me about this mystery, how two local men living in Larange, in Mum's hometown, were dropped off by plane at a lake an hour north of Larange, at Lower Foster Lake. They were working as prospectors, and they were dropped off um, by the, the plane that the company had arranged. And this is actually not, of course, that moment, but that is, in fact, Jim Brady jumping, jumping off of that plane. When their boss came by a week later to check on them and refresh their supplies, he found the camp had been set up, their beds had been slept in, and half-drunk cups of tea sat next to their extinguished campfire, but Jim and Brady were nowhere to be found. Now, when Mom told me about this disappearance, she would include a different detail, like when she told me that oddly, around the time of Jim and Abby's disappearance, it had been snowing, which isn't impossible in northern Saskatchewan in June. There were no footprints in the snow, by Jim and Abby recording that they had left the camp and no footprints of anyone, human or animal, arriving and their boss along with a pilot who flew him in on this pre-scheduled check-in were the first to make tracks in the snow and I always imagined in a point that cannot be true, that as the boss wandered through that abandoned empty campsite and he saw the cups of tea sitting by the campfire, that he would have gone to those cups and would have felt that the tea was still warm. Now, a couple of years after they went missing in 1969, the lawyer representing the Attorney General at the coroner's inquest summed up all the evidence that was found and the logic of the investigating officers. Quote, Mr. Prefontaine said, the area from the canoe, the ax marks and the match, the campfire in the raft 
with all pretty well in a line heading south from Lower Foster, eh? Unquote. And what he's assuming, what he's trying to convince the inquest of, is that this scanty trail of clues suggests that Jim and Abby attempted to walk out of the bush. Now, Mom told me that the police had decided that Jim and Abby had got lost in the bush, a point that made my mother roll her eyes. It's not impossible to get disoriented anywhere, and the train where Jim and Abby made camp was difficult. But these were men who grew up on the land and knew how to read it, and even alone, they would have had a lifetime of skills that would train them how to make their own way back to their campsite. And with two working together, it would have been difficult to get lost for long. Mom didn't mention that both missing men had high public profiles. She never mentioned that Jim Brady, age 59 when he went missing, was one of the Métis Famous Five. And these were political activists who secured land settlement for Métis in Alberta in the 1930s. She likely didn't know either Felix Callahu or Joe Dion, but she did know Malcolm Norris, um, although more as a friend of Jim's um, than as an activist. And she knew the fifth member, um, Pete Tompkins, as Mr. Tompkins, as a relative of sorts. Um, her sister Irene had married his son Frank, and also Mrs. Tompkins, Pete's wife on the far left, is next to my cook and my grandmother. Um, they were very good friends. To mom, Jim Brady was the man who lived in a little cabin in the middle of town, right next to her brother, my uncle George, and his wife, my Auntie Jane, and their kids, my cousins. The same cabin, incidentally, that when Jim wasn't there, Pete and Isabel Tompkins stayed in from time to time. Mum told me that inside, though inside the walls of Jim's cabin were covered with books. And I know from research that he also stored many more in various safe places. His library was large, with over 3,000 titles. And given the time and money it would have cost to assemble, he surely must have loved to read. In fact, people remember um, him saying as much. And if you want to browse the list of his eclectic collection, um, you can see a handwritten list, or hand-typed I should, list, I should say, of Jim's books on my research team's website, The People and the Text. This was one of the things that was just gifted to us as we were doing our research. As for Abby Halkett, Mum never talked about him much. She never mentioned, and I was really surprised to discover, that he was a sitting band counselor for the Lac Lorange Indian Band, although family lived on the reserve near him, my Auntie Bella and Uncle Edmund. The only time Mum mentioned Abby or Absalom, as she called him, was when she told me the story about how Abby Halkett was going blind, and he had sought out Cookham for medicinal help. In that story, Mum had mentioned that Abby Halkett wanted to become an Anglican minister, and that was a career choice made by a lot of indigenous intellectuals, a lot of Cree intellectuals in, in Saskatchewan. I'm thinking right, right away about Edward Ahenikew, you know, other bright minds also like Stan Cuthand, but there are many more. And while there were a lot more stories of Jim than of Abby, there are some descriptions I found in interviews. Uh, in 1976, interview with the cafe owner in La Ronge, Gwendolyn Beck, describes Abby as, quote, a young fellow that went out to res Indian residential schools, was very brilliant, and went on to university, unquote. And even though we never became a minister, he did serve as a school teacher for a time and then as a band counselor while he was a prospector with Jim. And in a 1978 interview, community, community organizer Leora Salter describes Abby as a really political person. Noted Métis author Maria Campbell has stated that Métis politics really stalled in Saskatchewan after Jim and Abby went missing. By the 1967 disappearance, Abby was 
about 39 years old, two decades, decades younger than Jim. Now, Mom told me that at some point, the police had determined that Jim and Abby had gotten lost in the bush, a point that made my mother snort in derision. She would explain that the police thought that Jim and Abby tried to walk out, and then she would exhale in exasperation. Sometimes, I think I understood why. Because when I've told people that I come from or my family comes from Saskatchewan, people often assume that it's on the plains, and they ask me, do you miss the open sky? It's as though they've never heard of the bush and muskeg and water that begins about an hour outside of Saskatoon around PA, around Prince Albert, and continues on. It is unthinkable that anyone who knew that land would try to walk out, especially when they knew a plane was scheduled to check in on them within the next week. Now, sometimes, Mom would tell me that even though the RCMP called off the search a couple of weeks after the disappearance, Jim and Abby's friends and community members continued to look for them all summer. And except for a few clues, like a found scuff mark on a rock wall, you know, some a pre, a point that we actually used in our research, the 1967 community search team found nothing. When I asked Mom, what happened to Jim and Abby? She told me the UFOs must have taken them. And that seemed more logical than any of the th other theories I'd heard up till that point. I also hold this, hold, heard this story often from my uncle Frank. As the son of Pete Tompkins, Frank grew up around Malcolm Norris and Jim Brady. And in fact, in a recent trip to the Glenbow archives, and I was going through day books, and Jim has all his day books there. He, you know, there's often many references to having dinner with Frank and Irene, sometimes even Christmas dinner. Once Irene passed in 19, pardon me, pardon me, in, once Irene passed on in 2005, I visited um, Frank in Saskatoon several times, sometimes with my family, sometimes alone. Usually my cousin Connie was there helping out her dad and in later years also her sister Pat. And Frank shared his stories about family, about his grandfather Pete Tompkins who had been a prisoner of war at um, Batoche. He talked about the fact that his grandmother had been Poundmaker's widow and I got this actually off his wall. He was very proud of the sto story he told me when he um, worked with the Saskatchewan Métis Association as a member of it, um, visiting England in the early 1980s to advocate for the inclusion of Métis rights in the 1982 Constitution of Canada. Uncle Frank talked about his memories of Brady and Norris, and regardless, at some point, he always turned to the details surrounding Jim and Abby's disappearance and often told me that it wasn't too late to conduct a search. He was convinced that the RCMP theories were wrong, that a murder had taken place, that the bodies could be found in Lower Foster Lake, and the lake was so cold that the bodies would be intact even after almost half a century. Frank would often launch into the precise stories of the days leading up to Jim and Abby's disappearance, complete with details to support his theories and suspicions. He was convinced that the prospectors had found a sizable mine worth millions of dollars and that they'd been murdered to cut them out of this claim. He was convinced the police were corrupt, um, either shielding the murderer or simply happy that Indigenous troublemakers like Jim and Abby were out of the way. And he often repeated the story that when Malcolm Norris, who at the time of the disappearance was on his sick, uh, 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 was elderly and sick and really on his deathbed, and when Malcolm Norris heard this, according to Uncle Frank, um, his first words in grief were, they got him, they got him. After all the work that Jim did as an activist, as a communist, Malcolm was sure that he had been done away with by the authorities. <laughs>
Now, when I completed my PhD in 2007, Uncle Frank became convinced that as I was a researcher, I would be able to follow up on his leads, find equipment to search the lake, find Jim and Abby, this bamboo. <laughs> and keep in mind, I teach indigenous literatures. <laughs> and I understand the responsibilities and obligations of our stories. While it seems to me that a typical literature professor has only to study and teach well, only, people who teach indigenous literatures struggle with a higher level of accountability. And as a relative, my level of obligation was tripled. Each time Frank told me about the disappearance, he was emphasizing my responsibility to him and to the story he was sharing with me. And I did what I could, which truthfully was very little. I wrote about Uncle Frank's theories and one, as one star in a constellation of family stories as a way to give it some attention. When I followed social media, I noticed that my little cousin Vanessa was part of a youthful contingent in LaRange who we're I'm not convinced that Jim and Abby had gotten lost and came to a bad end. It is, after all, one thing to get lost and perish even together. It's another to get lost, perish, and to hide any evidence of your remains. Now remember, Local trappers, trackers, hunters, fishers, people who knew this place searched the land around Larange, pardon me, around Lower Foster Lake for two months, the entire summer, long after the RCMP had left. And they found evidence like thrown away matches, but nothing of bodies or the equipment that Jim and Abby um, had carried with them. So it's possible that, I suppose, that a bear could have eaten not just one, but both of them. And this was one suggestion um, by the, raised at the inquest. But not likely their boots, their Geiger counters, their axes, their day packs, and the other things that they carried. Okay. These were all things that their boss identified as not being in the camp that they would have taken with them. So I researched the history as best I could, trying to make sense of northern mining in the 1960s, you know, without much luck. And while Uncle Frank was convinced that Jim and Abby had been murdered and dumped into Lower Foster Lake, I subsequently learned that many indigenous people in the north believe Jim and Abby were murdered and most suspect that their remains are in the lake. I therefore searched the details of marine archaeology, you know, as a literature professor, and became overwhelmed when I looked at the cost of sonar. And a lot of this came to a head in summer 2016 when Frank, at this point almost 90 years old, just called me explicitly and called me down. We were going to, we were going to get on this job. And I never articulated to him, which many of you might already realize that, you know, while I have been able to find documents, you know, written by indigenous authors in archives, you know, no one thinks that I'm the prime candidate to be able to find, you know, conduct search, searches and, and find bodies. While I can organize conferences and literary awards, I, I don't think I have the ability to lead searches underwater. And no one would mistake me as an outdoors woman. <laughs> On top of that, I was at the point in my life when my all three children were grown and raised and I was pouring myself into my work in a field that didn't even exist when I was an undergraduate. I knew that if I had endless time, I could eventually figure out how mining records worked or how all of these things worked, but I didn't have that and I had a limited skill set. I remember sitting down and writing out a research plan that included looking into mineral rights and hiring an underwater search team with as much confidence as if I had sketched out a plan to fly to the moon. I tried to figure out how to proceed when great fortune befell me. I had made a friendship with um, author Michael Nest, an Australian, um, who had actually been write, has written three books, one of them about the mineral coltan um, in Africa, and he works um, doing anti-corruption work in the mining industry as a consultant there. 
but he also worked on an autobiography by uh, um, an indigenous man who lives in, in Australia. And so he, he, we started talking about that. And, and he, he has um, in-laws who live in Vancouver, so he came over from Australia one holiday, and we were talking on the phone because the weather had been bad. That seems to be a theme. And uh, he told me that he and his partner were moving to, uh, moving to Montreal so his partner could go do a PhD at McGill. And because of his work, he could move along. It was fine. He was coming to Canada. And it suddenly struck me that Michael was moving to Canada, <laughs> where he knew very few, and with lots of time on his hands. <laughs> and I knew at that point that this story would intrigue him. And um, that's because the disappearance of Jim and Abby is the quintessential Canadian story to tell a newcomer. Two Indigenous men, well known in their community and in the prime of their lives, go out onto the land for work and vanish. The authorities conduct a cursory investigation, posit that it was the fault of the missing, decide the location is too isolated to continue a search, and determine that the case is unsolved and likely unsolvable. Meanwhile, Métis and Cree members of Jim and Abby's communities are certain there's been foul play. They see the various individuals and forces in society that might have been a threat to Jim and Abby, although the fact that one of those threats might be the authorities themselves means that community members don't know who to trust. The loss of these two leaders leaves a community devastated for a generation. The pain of the loss resonates through more than just the Brady and Halkett families. Meanwhile, mainstream Canada does not remember Jim or Abby or that they disappeared. Knowing that I couldn't solve this mystery alone and knowing that Michael could help, and we went to meet Uncle Frank and, um, and um, we started the search there. I trusted Michael's expertise, but also the fact that should we come to an impasse, Michael knew enough about Indigenous protocols that he would understand if we needed to walk away. I also knew that he would have the talent and time to write a book, and hence Cold Case North, North will be coming out this fall. We decided to meet in Saskatoon in August of 2017 and Michael was already up and to, to speed on all the documentation he could find about the case. A shout out to the work of Marie Dobbin who left behind a large amount of interviews um, that we've been able to use. Um, we headed up to La Ronge and we were blessed with the help of my cousin Eric, my Auntie Bella's middle son, who was just on the cusp of retirement with more time to spare than he'd ever had in his working life. Eric, along with his wife Wanda, are known to be to take good care of family, including his late father, his grandchildren, and his younger brother who has medical issues. Eric is an accomplished hunter, annually going with his son Jordan to hunt moose, both of them taking one each, and then a third that they share with elders in the community. Eric is as comfortable on the lake as he is on the land, and except for childhood years in residential school, he spent his entire life in the north. He started the emergency medical services in Larange and has attended or directed his staff to every mishap or tragedy in the community. He is exactly the right person to be in challenging situations. So my, my husband, who's also named Eric, was very happy that I was going with someone who would keep us safe. The fact that Eric knows pretty much everybody, or at least every family, in LaRange meant that if there was, uh, if there were an historical figure that we had questions about, Eric knew a way to reach out. It was only with Eric's involvement, intelligence, standing in the community, his understanding of the story, that we were able to get as far as we have, even as we kept asking permission along the way to continue. And we did ask for permission. First with Abby Halkett's only child, Rima, and she was re expressed relief that we were 
if someone was taking interest in this case. And also, we had the luck to be able to meet with Ann Dorian to make sure that she and her brothers and sisters were okay with us um, and this search. We went to her home in Larange and she asked us questions and told us that she understood our desire to keep looking. And I suspect she was relieved that Eric was involved, even as we still were not sure at that point what we would find. And one of the things that sprung out of these conversations is that Jim and Abby were missed as well as missing. And this became an unexpected connection to my work on Indigenous literatures in Canada. As a scholar, but even before that, as a reader looking for some reflection of my family's stories, and when I was a student, I noticed the absence of Indigenous writing in Canada, even as I assumed it didn't exist. And in recent years, however, as part of my research in archives, I've come across a wealth of material by Indigenous authors that have been neglected by academics and publishers. For example, at the very same time, I was as an undergraduate in the 1980s, reading Duncan Campbell Scott, his poetry, as one of the Confederation poets. And yes, that's the Duncan Campbell Scott, who was uh, used residential schools to kill the Indian in the child. Vera Manuel, uh, who happens to be the daughter of Marceline Paul and George Manuel, um, the um, whose accomplishments were many. She was writing about the horrors of residential school and stories that were never published. And um, this was not for through lack of trying. I'm honored to be a part of a team of four editors, all Indigenous women, who were able to put together an anthology of her work this, this past year, in 2019. And I, by the way, if you, should you find this book in a bookstore, go immediately to the middle section to her stories. These are profoundly amazing stories about the residential school experience, uh, beautifully, beautifully told. At exactly the same time in the late 1980s when Alanisa Bomswin, the Abenaki filmmaker, came to my class at Concordia and talked about indigenous writing, or native writers, she would have said in those days, and I went up to her at the end and said, is it true, are there really native writers in Canada? Because I certainly didn't see it in any of the curriculum that I was studying, and I was a third year undergraduate in English department. And I had actually been to three different universities from travel, that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> um, at that very same time, um, German scholar Hartmut Lutz was here in Canada traveling to record interviews with every Canadian indigenous writer that he could find, and you can access over 70 of these interviews on the website, the people in the text under the interviews tab. Um, and the cassettes are still sitting in my office. We really must find something to do with that. Anyway, and it's in one of these interviews that when Lutz talks with Maria Campbell, and she talks about her experience in editing, um, when her classic book, Half Breed, published in 1973, um, included a passage um, where, um, of a sexual assault by the RCMP that was um, taken out by her editors without her permission. Um, this, um, I was able to ask um, Maria Campbell's permission for us to look for that, and um, I'm very grateful that my, uh, one of the graduate students here at SFU that I work with, uh, um, Archive Ninja, Alex Shield, uh, when she was at, doing a, a, at a research trip in McClelland and Stewart Archives in fall 2017, found those missing pages. And in 2019, this book was reissued, Half Read was reissued with those missing pages. All of this to say that these unpublished materials were missed by readers who longed to learn about these stories, missed especially by Indigenous readers who yearned to read something that reflected our own families and communities. And even though as a young person I assumed that Indigenous people didn't go to school, didn't write books, I since have discovered how often the publishing industry has foiled and failed our writers. While searching for Jim and Abby, 
I spent some time at the Glenbow Museum in Calgary looking at the substantial collection of Jim's papers. There are about 43 boxes, actually. This is just an image. And there I discovered that Jim wasn't just an avid reader, but also a dedicated researcher who wrote a lot as, um, as part of his work and as a correspondent with fellow political organizers and intellectuals. And in a 1950 letter by li university librarian Brian Peel, Peel thanks Brady for Brady's translation of um, Marcel Giraud's Le Métier Canadien, which included a lot of a material never published in English before. And Peel lets Brady know that he's about to submit an essay to the journal Saskatchewan History and states, quote, I, in a footnote, I acknowledge your assistance, which is great citational practice. Yet, despite all his writing and research, Brady is not able to get his own writing in print. As far as researchers have found, his planned autobiography um, doesn't, doesn't, wasn't never, either neither, never completed or is not among his papers. However, one story foundational to his Achimisawin, his life story, was a 10-page history entitled The Wisdom of Papas Cheo, Cree Medicine Man, about a neighbor and a family friend. Brady's grandfather was Laurent Garneau, who had fought with Louis Riel and suffered in defeat, and yet later in life became wealthy. And so if you know the Garneau district in Edmonton, next to the University of Alberta, it was named after Brady's grandfather. Brady writes about how his family had been helped by Chief Pappas Chase after the rebellion, only to witness Chief Pappas Chase's reserves, reserve lands be encroached upon the city of Edmonton, and then a generation later experienced an encroachment of their own lands. Here, Brady models the respect one needs to have for stories that are shared with you. In this unpublished work, one of the um, teachings I've learned is my obligation to stories. One of the teachings is to listen. When faced with a detail outside my experience, it's important to set aside epistemic certainty in order to see how this enriches or it helps me appreciate what the story is telling me. So for example, when Jim Brady describes Pappas Cheo as, quote, a rare combination of band chief and medicine man being possessed of clairvoyant and clairaudient powers, I'm not concerned with whether or not this is true or whether or not you think it's true. I think about the teachings underlying his prophecy when faced by violence from white settlers who want to take his reserved land away from him and his people. In his story, Brady tells us that in 1892, Pappas Chase takes time to consider his band's options in the fate of the threat of settlers and then directs his people to leave their territory to avoid bloodshed. Quote, we must find the pathway that leads to the stars, unquote. And the band moves west. To the Rocky Mountains. And then in this unpublished piece, Brady shares another story. When his family visits Pappas Cheo circa 1906, their community, the St. Paul Half-Breed Reserve or St. Paul de Miti, was under threat. And Pappas Cheo spends some time, some days praying and fasting, confirming after that, after that spiritual process that Brady's community would lose their land, but also prophesizing about three oncoming great wars. Remember, Papas Cheo was prophesying this in 1906. The first, he said, would break out in 10 years, another a generation later, and then a last great battle because the pale face is never satisfied. He wants everything under the sun. And I think about the teachings underlying his words. These are warnings from someone who'd already experienced invasion and displacement when Can Canadian settlement pushed him and his people off their territory. And in 2020, it's not difficult to hear the warning in Papas Cheo's prophecy. Now, in order to get this story published, Brady reached out to a political friend, anthropologist Charles Brandt from the University of Alberta. <clears throat> 
And Charles Brandt is critical. Quote, you were right in assuming that my scientific training and attendant skepticism makes me tend to reject occult explanations of anything. But as historical materialists, I think this view is incumbent upon us. Can we, for instance, reject the pie-in-the-sky Christian view of life and afterlife as nonsense and political dope peddling, but at the same time accept occultistic, supernaturalistic explanations of events by medicine men, just because the latter are Indians, Africans, Australian Aboriginals, or whatever? I think we have to be consistent. Brady, still? submits the manuscript to the Alberta Historical Review and receives further criticism from his, about his article, but this time for different reasons. In 63, editor Hugh Dempsey writes, as an historian, I'm obliged to consider any manuscripts in the cold light of recorded facts. While I am sure the traditions of your family have been faithfully recorded in the manuscript, they do not completely agree with the official records. And in this case of Dempsey, he doesn't mention the occult instances, but instead believes the critique of how the reserve fell into the hand of settlers is incorrect. Quote, the whole matter of the sale, a surrender and sale of the Pappas Chase Reserve has been a murky one and was likely accompanied by a certain amount of graft and corruption. However, it is still a fact that the reserve had been legally surrendered by the time the railroad came and the land was already falling into the hand of white settlers. And Dempsey expresses at the end that he is truly sorry that we cannot use this manuscript. And it's such a common situation among Indigenous authors that I've seen time after time. These writers aspire to publication are uniquely qualified to write that which no one else would be able to do, and yet are rejected because um, with the explanation that their work is deficient or unbelievable. So while I've been taught the value of listening, I've also learned the value of resisting intimidation. If someone like anthropologist Charles Brandt, Charlie, who didn't like the occult in this story, tells me that it's incumbent to reject occult explanations of anything, I can question his wisdom. And tellingly, it ha just so happens that um, Brandt's PhD research was on the story of culture, culture heroes of the Kiowa Apache people. And it, he didn't discuss the content of those stories, but instead spent a lot of time determining whether they were more Kiowa or Apache. So in other words, rather than listening to the teachings in the stories, he was trying to categorize them. And likewise, Dempsey prioritized the evaluation of Brady's manuscript under the cold light of recorded facts, safeguarding the settler version of history, that the land had been legally surrendered in order to oppose the accounts of Indigenous people. And I urge all of you, if you aren't familiar with this case, simply to Google Papa's Chase to realize that it is an ongoing fight for the return of those lands. Okay, so let's get back to the search. Let's return briefly to Lower Foster Lake. We did go up three times in the summer and fall of 2018 and then August 2019 to walk the site of Jim and Abby's last camp. All of this is well laid out in the inquest materials. It just so happens that while Jim and Abby had to make camp on Lower Foster in 1967, uh, our search party did not, <laughs> by a baffling <laughs> point of good luck, I guess, in the mid-1970s, Jacques Cousteau wanted to build a cabin somewhere where there were a lot of beavers <laughs> for a documentary. And so, lucky us, <laughs> <laughs> it is now a fly-in fishing lodge where we were able to stay. So we flew in and, of course, they allowed us to use their pontoon boats and their other things. I mean, I, just any lake he could have gone to, but thank you, shock. <laughs> so in August 2018, Michael, Eric, and I went with Lac La Ronge band members Thompson McKenzie, actually it's on the end, and Stanley Roberts to scan the lake bottom. <laughs> 
Stanley and Thompson are sonar experts. Um, their um, um, community, the um, Grandmother's Bay, have actually purchased sonar equipment for their community um, on the very sad reason because that, um, being by a lake there are, are drownings and they, you, they learned how to retrieve um, um, remains. And so, uh, in a kind of unlikely amazing connection, um, we flew together. Um, Trout, uh, pardon me, um, Lower Foster Lake is known for its no northern pike and large lake trout because they live in the deepest parts of Lower Foster Lake, uh, drawing fishermen from all over the world. Before the tourist trade, it was well known by local indigenous fishers, uh, you know, as knowledge passed on for them from them gen from past generations. Uh, the sonar that we used recorded depths um, of 37 meters. Now, in order to use the sonar, we had Eric at the wheel of the pontoon boat driving backwards, and we had Stanley under a tarp looking at a laptop connected to the sonar looking for anomalies. He had to have a tarp so the sun glare wouldn't get to him, sort of staring. And although there is a, a use for video games, I think, to train you to look at sonar anyway. And then Thompson showed Michael how to monitor the line attached to the sonar starfish. And we drove back and forth and as close as we could to a grid pattern to systematically cover the terrain while correcting for wind, waves, in an area that was not square. And I cannot overemphasize the skill that it took, especially for Eric at the wheel. Now, once we got used to how the sonar worked, we decided on the morning of the second day to go to the end of the lake where Jim and Abby had made their camp, where their canoe had been found by the boss that had gone to see them. The canoe was pulled up on the shore. I still remember Thompson and Eric talking about the many possible adversaries in a variety of scenarios. You know, who could have approached Jim and Abby? Would they have been lured into or maybe hauled into a boat on a snowy June day? And once they were killed, where else would be better to ensure that they were never to be found than to weigh them down and dump them in the deepest part of the lake? It's kind of a gruesome amount of conversations actually about how bodies will float to the top unless they're intentionally weighed down in horrible ways. And so as we're sitting at that one end of the lake and we're just pausing for a bit and we're thinking through the train we've passed and we're remembering that sort of uh, 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 some ways up the lake is a sandy beach and next to the sandy beach is a rock cliff and on that rock cliff in 1967, McIver Ainanu noticed that the lichen had been smudged. These are some of the very few kinds of clues that, that they found. They found almost nothing else, but um, McIver Ainanu found the lichen had been smudged. And what he saw when he went up was right beside it in the water were a bunch of foliage, reeds and leaves that didn't belong there. No, it's not like somebody could have pulled them locally and then dumped them there. They had to have had it in the boat and then take, taken it there. And so he had suggested, in a point that was never followed up, um, that possibly it had been used to clean out a boat. And so we were going under the assumption that um, if the bodies then were in the lake, that maybe that would be the point where the boat had been cleaned out. And so as we were staring up the lake, from where we were sitting, from the campsite, thinking about that sandy beach. And you also made the point, um, McIver, I don't know, that a regular boat would just pull up on the sandy beach. Like, why would you not, unless you were trying to do something over, uh, covert? And Thompson and Eric noticed that, of course, one of the major trout holes on Lower Foster happens to be marked by um, two... Um, uh, what do you call prominent overhanging bluffs and it was Eric who reminded us that someone 50 years before would need a ma map or sonar to find the deepest part of the lake that the bluffs marked that spot you know it was really there was several points in time when Thompson said you know you really know how to read the land and so we had a directly for this trout hole marked by the bluffs and put down the sonar and 
This is a very large lake. This was day two. And with the expertise of Thompson and Eric, who knew and could read the land and the water, who concluded that it was the most likely place to start, we settled down in, and within about two hours, we found anomalies through sonar that were later confirmed by the sonar expert, experts in lab, labs in Saskatoon and in Washington, D.C. to be human remains. Now, it, it wasn't luck. It was the belief that Jim and Abby had to be somewhere, and um, we listened to these stories with respect. And so, again, we found um, something that has been substantiated as human remains. I do want to caution. We, we don't know at this point yet who they were. But let me unpack the power of listening to stories and what our obligations are to stories. You have to ask permission to tell someone else's stories. And there are specific protocols that different nations hold over who owns certain cultural stories. Our stories are not free for all. A family member can tell, call you into a story, and because you have obligations to family members, you have obligations to their stories. And in this case, my uncle called me into this story. I didn't have a choice. When someone shares with a story with us, we have the obligation to listen. We have to be patient. Repetition is not bad editing. Repetition provides emphasis. The more stories that are told to us, the more obligations we have to the original story, to remember it, to learn it. We have the obligation to set aside previous assumptions, to focus upon not the truth value as much as the teachings in the story. We have to keep an eye open for coercive stories that are telling us what to do and how to interpret. We have to monitor our own power in the equation so that we don't overstep. Asking permission is not a one-time action, but an ongoing part of the process. Do you have permission to tell the story? Do you have permission to continue? Can you recognize that sometimes you have to stop? That you might have permission to begin, but you don't have permission to continue? And this came up in a conversation with Thompson when he ta taught us a word in Cree, pastawin, which he translated for us as a warning, a warning against the passing of a forbidden point. An elder shared with Eric the, uh, a translation of pastawin to mean Sometimes you'll get signs that tell you that this is as far as you can go. I've also come to realize that our positions affect whether and how a story is told, and your position shifts throughout your life. While I was a young girl, my job was to listen and remember. And as an adult and an academic, I have increased responsibilities. As someone with access to publishing, I have responsibilities to help our people be able to tell their stories and get published. And this isn't everybody's obligations, but it's mine. You have your own obligations. It just so happens that on the 24th of April, 2019, my uncle Frank, age 92, passed away. Now, he really never grew older from about age 65 to age 90. I kid you not. He looked exactly the same my entire life, really. But when we stopped by in the summer of 2018 to show him the, the sonar scans and to tell him you know, what we were thinking, um, he had been ill. And it's, uh, his, suddenly his age caught up to him. We were all happy to know that we could share these preliminary results. The night before he passed, my cousin Connie called me. He'd asked her to call me. And he wanted to pass on the message to not stop looking, to get to the bottom of the lake, to get to these stories. Thank you.
about a story about obligations to stories. And uh, I think the response of all of us is indicative of how appreciative we are uh, of the privilege of listening to Deanna tell us this amazing story of research, inquiry, history, and stories. And you now have the opportunity uh, to ask some questions or offer some comments and ask Deanna to respond. We'll, we'll do that for a bit and then we'll also uh, uh, conclude with the formal part of the evening and uh, allow uh, people to uh, have some light refreshments and Deanna's kindly agreed to stay behind and, and talk to, to people in that context as well. But who would like to uh, pose a question or, uh, or a comment for Deanna to respond to? We have some microphones. We have Arnaz and Moz with microphones ready to, uh, to help you to amplify your voice. Over here, Judy. <laughs> There's, hang on, we, we, because we're videoing this uh, for YouTube, uh, we need you to, to speak to the microphone. Thank you, Dr. Reeder. Um, I'm interested in the practicality. How did you work out the funding? <laughs> Thank oh, you. sordid <laughs> topic of money. Deanna. I, I have to say that I, have, I want to give a shout out to um, Vice President Research, Joy Johnson. I had a bit of a snag at one point. I did use, use my CHAIRS grants, and that, which are more flexible funding. And then I um, also, when I was acting Dean of Libraries, rather, I was able to get, rather than the wage bump, the, the money for research funding, because suddenly, I had a sonar to pay for it that I, had, I couldn't apply for. And I tell you, um, that would only happen with a you know, VPR who is flexible and, and also actually at one point, I was um, dipped into some of her own funding. And it was genuine for her own personal work. And I, I was very grateful for that kind of support and encouragement because it is, um, this really isn't the kind of research where you can sit down and say, this is my research plan and here are the next five years and I, this is what I'm gonna do. So I think you have to have an administration that is going to be supportive. And of course, we need to be accountable. I mean, you know, when I'm, and I, I should also mention, thank you, I just recalled as well, that um, in the last search, um, the Métis Association of Saskatchewan and um, also uh, the um, Lac La Lorange Indian Band both also donated for the search. So the Social Science and Humanities Research Council isn't used to funding sonar equipment, is that? <laughs> I should mention that Dr. Joy Johnson, the Vice President of Research, is also our president designate, will become president September 1st. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to know she's already supportive of this kind of research. Um, any other questions or comments people have over here? And we have a microphone right by you. Yes, please. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was thinking about um, the book, The One and a Half Men by Murray Dobin, which is really like the only, um, the closest thing we have to maybe uh, having substantial information about Jim Brady or that would be available to the public, but it's been out of print for a long time and I don't think many people even know that that book exists. I was wondering if you've heard of anything, of anyone wanting to like republish that or? It would be a great book to republish actually. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to the Gabriel DeMont Institute. They have a lot of those interviews up on their website. They keep going. And that would have been the interviews that Marie Dobbin and also Associates did in order to conduct the research for that book. But I mean, I think that's a huge, uh, um, there's a huge opportunity um, to, to do additional work. I know that I was talking to Donald Smith, who's an historian who's done a lot of biographies. And he was sort of c encouraging me to write a, the bi official biography of Jim Brady that could maybe uh, draw on Dobbin's previous work. Uh, it's such a big job. He was such a huge personality, I, and I'm not really an historian. I'd love to uh, encourage some historian here or some PhD student who maybe has specific interests in, in or maybe even personal connections, um, because there's a lot of work to be done, and there, that archive I, I, has been started to be used. There is a couple of uh, young, a couple of articles that are being used on just Jim Brady's archive, but there's a ton of stuff to do. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else like to pose a question or offer a comment? Right here. We'll get you a microphone. It's on its way. Yes, please, go ahead. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you because it's touched very, very mm. deep in a core of my being, and at this time in our history, 
I am wondering if we will not see repeats of something similar. And it's um, very fitting that you're sharing the information at this time. There, it is a, I mean, there's so many um, things that are missing, you know, um, so many loved ones that are missing. And I, I think that my research is really unfolding and ma making me realize, which I think many of us already do realize, how it, that structurally fit, fit. I mean, the, at some point, we, 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 not wanting to get, talk too much about the book, but we did take the sonar scans to the, uh, the RCMP, the, who's in charge of hi historical missing person cases in northern Saskatchewan. And he said that it was too remote <laughs> to do the work, to, to follow up on this. This, this is, <laughs> this is the, what, where, what else, where would you find the local <laughs> uh, site to investigate in northern Saskatchewan? You know, it, it kind of boggles the mind, um, the, the resistance, to, um, but uh, of course we take heart to, to the work of people who are looking for the missing. Yeah. Other questions, comments? I mean, I'll ask the question, are, is, is there further inquiry going to go on to try to recover the remains and, and identify them? Uh, it's, well, so, some of that will be in the book. <laughs> so let's give all away. Um, but certainly, Which is available f at a certain price at a certain time. <laughs> well, not yet. We don't have a cover even yet, but it's getting to proof soon. Um, we... we um, one of, on one of the days, we wrapped up something uh, uh, quicker than we expected. And so we flew back from Lower Foster Lake to La Ronge. And my cousin Lillian, it just so happens, it uh, works for the La Ronge Indian Band uh, trying to build a, um, a healing lodge. And she's a phenomenal person. I'm just uh, grateful to be able to say she's my cousin, but she's many, 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 many more things. Um, and she, um, it happened that there was a cultural day going on. If we hadn't um, come home that day early, I wouldn't have bumped into her in the middle, you know, in the middle of the local park. And the relationships that are kind of being re-energized re and rebuilt, that I, I know that it's going somewhere else, but I, I, um, a lot of it is um, in process right now. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to wait for the book. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Oh, it, it's yeah, called Cold Case North, uh, searching for James Brady and Absalom Halkett. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I must say one of the huge privileges for me of being at Simon Fraser University is to be in the company of scholars like uh, Deanna Rader. Um, scholarship that is, is just extraordinary, compelling, and cuts in so many different ways, illuminates in so many different ways. And the other pleasure is being able to share some of this scholarship with a broader audience than would be the case if it was contained just within the university. Of course, it's going to be coming out in a book. But uh, please join with me in thanking Deanna for just an amazing lecture and for the research she's done to make it possible. Thank you. I'll do a little promo for the next lecture here. Now, a few, a few other uh, concluding remarks. I do want to thank uh, SFU Public Square staff who work very hard to make this lecture se series possible and who've been carrying the mics and preparing and standing outside. But please join me, with me in giving them a round of applause. We do have some coffee, cookies, and tea outside, so I encourage you to stay on and have conversation amongst yourselves and, uh, and with Deanna and, and, and to, to uh, share your uh, reactions and experiences and feelings about tonight's lecture. I also encourage you to check on the SFU Public Square website for upcoming events, the uh, annual community summit, which will deal with, uh, with uh, issues of inequality will be coming up shortly, and that will be a major event. We also have two uh, President's Faculty lectures still to come this year, and you can book tickets on the website. On Tuesday, February 25th, uh, we'll be in our stunning new building out in Surrey, a building that houses our new sustainable energy engineering program.
and there we'll be hearing a lecture from Applied Sciences Professor Dr. Faranek uh, Furzan on neuroengineering lens into treatment of youth mental health and addiction. It's an amazing researcher who's using technology to address issues of addiction and mental health. You'll want to hear from her. And the last lecture, lecture in this year's series will be delivered by English professor Paul Boudra, well known as, as an expert on Shakespeare, uh, gives lectures at Bard on the Beach on the various productions there. And he'll be speaking on the Shakespeare conspiracy at the Shalbolt Center for the Arts in Burnaby on Tuesday, March 10th. So mark all of those in your calendar. If you haven't marked them, they're on the SFU Public Square website. Look for other events. And thank you for coming out, because as an engaged university, we can only engage if you engage with us. And uh, you, give us, uh, you give us added impetus and energy through your coming out to events like this, and I thank you for that. And I look forward to seeing you uh, at our next uh, Public Square events, uh, uh, including the lectures that I mentioned. So thank you for coming tonight, and do stay and have some cookies and uh, coffee and, and cookies. Thank you.